Terrific. Well, Absolutely. People are starting to filter their way in. It'll take a moment or two because uh, everyone's trying to get in the door. But welcome to everyone who's made it in so far. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here on day four of Reimagining the Internet. Um, it has been uh, quite a conversation so far. Uh, we had um, an opening day uh, talking about this idea of radically different internet spaces, um, talking about different models with me and also with uh, Catherine Maher. Um, we then, um, you know, found ourselves uh, exploring a, another set of topics through Tuesday uh, around mis and disinformation uh, with Francesca Tripodi, Barbara Fister, really lively conversations around that. Yesterday, I got the day off, which was wonderful. We had Corey Doctorow. Uh, we had Daphne Keller uh, doing a great job of keeping us firmly rooted in reality. And my friend Alex Abdo took over. Uh, I am your host today for our day night double header. Uh, and we are starting off today uh, with two friends who have a great deal of perspective on how local communities actually work, how they function, what they do well, and, and what they don't do as well. Uh, I was telling the two of them just as people were starting to come in here that actually my desire to bring the two of them into conversation um, sort of designed the format uh, for this conference. I wanted to take speakers uh, who may not have had the chance to speak to one another, who may not have been thinking uh, entirely in terms of sort of reinventing the internet, but really learning from their experience. Before I introduce the two, let me just sort of remind you some of the ground rules for this. Um, the chat is open right now if anyone wants to shout out or say hello. It's going to close um, once people start speaking because it's pretty distracting for the speakers to see the chat comments going by. Uh, Michael Wood Lewis is going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Sarah Lomax Reese is going to talk for a similar amount of time. And then I'm going to bring the two of them uh, into conversation with me, with each other, and with y'all. And so as folks are talking, please do not be shy about using the Q&A feature um, and uh, sharing out uh, your thoughts on all of this. Um, everything that we're doing here is on the record. Um, if you feel like sharing it, um, we're asking people to use the reimagine hashtag. You'll see me tweeting about that on Twitter as well. So our theme today is lessons from local. Um, one of the things that comes up again and again in a United States context when people talk about political polarization, separation, you know, can we really live together as citizens, everyone sort of says, yeah, 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 but that's at the federal level. Everything's great at local. We'll just engage within local communities and local politics. And for anyone who has found themselves in a local political fight, a local civic fight, uh, you know just how ferocious those things can be. The next town over for me, Williamstown, Massachusetts, has lost its police chief and its town manager because it turned out that the police department uh, had pictures of Adolf Hitler mm -hmm. hanging in the police station. And you can imagine in a progressive college town what this is leading to. And it's a level of political fight that you don't normally get to see because it gets very, very personal and very, very close to home. In fact, local communities are so hard that within sort of the internet studies community, we have what's called the next door problem, where we look at next door, one of the most successful platforms to host local conversations. And unfortunately, it often ends up being an incredibly racist space, a space in which people are viewing each other with enormous amounts of suspicion. So, when I think about local, I try to think about highly successful local communities and particularly highly successful mediated local communities. And that's why I've invited our two guests here today. Um, speaking second, but introduced first, uh, is my friend Sarah Lomax Reese. She's the president and CEO of WURD Radio. It's Pennsylvania's only Amer African American owned talk radio station. Um, she's really transformed this station 
from a kind of a legacy talk radio station, a kind that seemed to be going out of business across the US to a multimedia company with original programming on air and online and through community events. It's an incredible model uh, for what radio can do for mobilizing the community. Um, she's also served as an adjunct professor of communications at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta. Um, she's been involved with just countless commissions and conversations about the future of journalism. We actually met through one of these uh, run by the Aspen Institute and the Knight Foundation. Um, also in our conversation actually leading off today uh, is going to be my neighbor, Michael Wood Lewis. Uh, in fact, neighbors are uh, something that Michael thinks a lot about. Um, his bio tells us that he's been pulling neighbors together in his community since he uh, spent his childhood in Indiana organizing local baseball games. Um, but he's really known for Front Porch Forum, which he and his wife Valerie founded in Burlington, Vermont. It's a network of small online local forums um, and it's incredibly hard to sort of like overstate how pervasive it is within the state of Vermont. Um, for every thousand households in the state, Front Porch Forum has 750 members. Um, he's been a community leader for a long time, um, working on a trade association in New England Utilities, before that, working with municipal leaders in development, uh, developing environmental technologies. He's got a background uh, in recycling and, and uh, thinking about the environment. Uh, but he's really become, uh, for me, one of the wisest and most thoughtful people uh, about local communities online. So um, you heard me on Monday uh, celebrating the wonders of small and that small can be beautiful. Uh, let's get small, let's get local and uh, let's start out with uh, Michael Wood Lewis. Michael, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ethan. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, yeah, well, well, uh, I, it's a real pleasure being here and sharing the stage with Ethan and with Sarah. Um, I'm looking forward to learning more. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, the earlier sessions of this conference. Um, so again, my name is Michael Wood Lewis. I'm co-founder of Front Porch Forum uh, with my wife, Valerie. Uh, and I wanted to share just a little bit of introduction about what that is and how it works and then get into more of the topic of the day. So um, we started Front Porch Forum, a precursor back in 2000. So we have been doing this for more than 20 years, uh, which is shocking for me to say, uh, surprising, I should say. And the general concept is Front Porch Forum is a family owned small business in Vermont. And we are mission driven. In fact, uh, FPF is a public benefit corporation, which puts our uh, social mission on equal footing with our financial goals. And our mission is to help neighbors connect and build community. It's really all about uh, fostering more resilient uh, towns, neighborhoods, small communities all across our state. So the way we work on that is by hosting, as Ethan said, local online forums uh, where neighbors, clearly identified neighbors, can communicate. And it's a very particular model that we've evolved over the years on our own platform, custom-built uh, software. And I start off talking about mission, and uh, I can talk more about kind of the values of, of what's driving all this. Um, and I know that could seem a lot like lip service, um, but from a, you know, I'm, I'm, my background is in engineering. And, you know, if you're designing something, those founding principles are really uh, crucial. They're, they're at the core of everything. And so if, you're, if your founding principles are to scale as rapidly as possible, or to um, produce a 10x return for your investors, um, you know, those are very different founding principles. So, um, a little bit about Front Porch Forum. Uh, we uh, host this network uh, across the state. It's in Vermont, of course, if you don't know, is tiny and largely rural, um, but we do have uh, you know, one small city in Burlington 
And we do have, you know, uh, challenges that, that you see everywhere. Uh, the opioid epidemic has been uh, severe in our state. Uh, the economy has had its struggles. Um, you know, we've, we've been visited with natural disasters. Uh, so, you know, there's, uh, in, in, um, you know, the challenges of racial justice uh, are here present in Vermont as they are elsewhere, et cetera. Of course, the pandemic hit, hit us as it did everyone. Um, and so on with, with our forum, every community has their own local forum. So about 200 of them uh, that we host across the state and each one covers approximately a thousand households. Um, as Ethan mentioned, out of those thousand households, we have 750 members on average um, in each of those forums. So it is an incredible level of traction and I'm bragging a little bit, but mostly I'm stating it to make a point that um, it's really incredible when you get a majority of a local community in a moderated um, online space um, and they stick around for years. And like I said, we've been doing this for two decades. So people tend to join Front Porch Forum and, and stick around. Um, and that's because that's one of our goals. Um, and so there are many different uh, design criteria that, that go into things like that. For example, one of our goals is to retain people's attention for five or 10 minutes a day, and then have that lead to more in-person interaction among neighbors in the real world. So we don't measure things, uh, we, we don't strive to maximize, uh, we, we don't find, define engagement as hours spent on our platform. You know, we, we don't want people sticking around on our platform. Again, we want five or 10 minutes a day of their attention and they'll see postings from neighbors about local issues. And the vast majority of postings are not uh, political in nature. They're not um, snarky uh, and sarcastic like you can get into in a lot of online spaces. They're generally neighbors expressing a need, uh, asking for advice uh, about a plumber, needing to borrow a ladder, needing help looking for their lost dog, that kind of thing. And then it's people responding and, and pitching in uh, to be helpful. Um, a lot of uh, the response on Front Porch Forum happens directly uh, from, you know, uh, via email off our platform or via going next door and, you know, knocking on the next apartment's uh, uh, front door or the next house down the rural road, whatever, and saying, hey, I heard you need a hand, you know, moving that heavy bookcase. Uh, I'm here with my teenager, you know, let's get it done. Um, so, uh, the way I, I tend to think of Front Porch Forum with all of these local postings day in and day out, month in and month out over the years is each one of those uh, little uh, uh, postings is, is kind of a strand in a web of connectedness in a community. Um, it's really all about increasing social capital among neighbors. It's not you know, clearly it's not a dating app. It's not, we're not trying to um, make people best friends with their next door neighbors. But the idea is if you live in a community um, in, you know, 2021 in, in uh, the United States, chances are for a lot of people, they don't know their neighbors. They don't know what's going on around them. And their attention is, uh, you know, uh, uh, captured by big tech social media and by traditional mainstream media. And that attention doesn't go to local, right? It goes out. It goes out to your network of old friends who might be spread around. It goes out to um, um, you know, CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or whatever about what catastrophe is happening where in the world. Um, it goes out to social media where you're trapped in an echo chamber. And oftentimes those things lead people to be afraid. You know, it, it, they're, they're, they're designed to, to stoke fear. And, um, and, you know, the world is a scary, dangerous place uh, full of people I don't know or understand. 
Front Porch Forum is very much the opposite. It tries to shed a light on the things we have in common with the people around us. So we might have different political bumper stickers on our car, but we'd both like to see the park cleaned up at the end of the street. So who's with me in doing a, a cleanup uh, this Saturday morning uh, at 9 a.m.? I'll bring trash bags, uh, I suggest, you know, recommend you wear gloves. Uh, we saw some uh, you know, discarded needles and the bushes. We got to pick those up for any kids gets hold of them. So, you know, those kind of activities again and again um, is, are what we see on Front Porch Forum. And, you know, it, that increases social capital again among neighbors and leads people to feeling like not I'm afraid of my neighbors who I don't know or of difference, but more like, yeah, I don't agree with John across the street on all things, but he's a good guy. And he helped me last, uh, you know, last year when my mom had a fall and, and broke her hip and, you know, he showed up uh, three days in a row to help us in, in a critical way. So that's what, uh, in fact, I get a little choked up just thinking about um, the, the huge number of wonderful stories uh, that we, uh, folks who work here, get a witness every day. So a little more about how the model works. Every posting on Front Porch Forum is moderated by our staff. And we have, a, our staff has grown to about two dozen people. About half of us are online community managers um, and uh, reviewing the postings before publication and uh, responding to member support uh, inquiries. Um, the, uh, also the, the content comes out um, on average once a day. So, this is not your Facebook feed um, where it's coming out in real time continuously, where it might, you know, if enough people complain about it, it might be moderated after the fact. Um, this is, you submit your material, it gets in our queue, it gets a brief review by our staff and 99% of content sails straight through. But that 1% uh, that, that gets flagged for an internal conversation makes a big difference. Um, in, in just checking in on, on those things. We have um, publicly available uh, terms of use on our website, frontporchforum.com that explain you know, what's, what's allowed and not allowed. And basically we started with the premise that any content's allowed. Uh, and then we slowly started learning what we needed to exclude. So no personal attacks. Uh, we say, you know, address the issue, not, not the neighbor. Um, so if it's, uh, if John, that neighbor has a dog and I've got a problem with the dog, I don't post, we, we don't like to see postings about, you know, John's a real jerk because his dog, you know, did whatever. Instead, we encourage the people to post about, um, you know, dogs in general, like there's a problem in our neighborhood with this loose dog and, you know, what should we do about it? Um, but that requires active management, active engagement. Um, we also don't permit uh, postings about things that are illegal. Um, you know, our, our laws about um, uh, 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 cannabis have changed in Vermont. And so our rules have changed about, you know, what's permissible to post. Um, so, uh, but it's um, for folks who aren't on Front Porch Forum and only have a point of reference of other big tech social media like Facebook or Nextdoor, it's, it's quite different. It's more like a daily neighborhood, small town newsletter that lands on your virtual front porch once a day. And there's content there from your neighbors and from uh, your elected officials, from the small businesses in the, in the community, from the nonprofits. And it might be five, 10, 20 postings and you skim through them, you read a couple, you respond to one or two, and you move on. And if you're inspired to that, you know, to respond to somebody, you might do it directly, you might do it in person, um, or you might post. But again, it's not a continuous scroll, it's not, you know, endless threads of, of, of people fighting with each other. Um, so I mentioned our mission. Our mission is all about, um, oh, I should, all about my 
30 slides here. Um, so I've been talking mostly about community building. Um, we also focus, uh, you know, a, a critical part of resilient local communities are the people, the local institutions, the local government, the local business sector. So um, we, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead here, local economy. So um, we've had uh, 10, in our very small state, 10,000 small businesses and nonprofits sign up to participate on Front Porch Forum. And it's crucial. Uh, it's, it's really an important part of what we do. They post and they find customers. They post and they find um, employees. They post to find suppliers. Um, and people post all the time looking for those small businesses, whether it's a plumber recommendation or what's, you know, what, what's people's neighbor's favorite uh, pizza shop or during the pandemic, you know, who's open? who's doing delivery. Um, so the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, stimulus to buying local and uh, to small local businesses. On a similar front, um, the local nonprofit sector sees a tremendous value and they participate, uh, thousands of them participate. I think Vermont has the most registered nonprofits uh, per capita of any state in the union, uh, forever that's worth. Um, and so we see a lot of them participating um, on Front Porch Forum and they bring a lot of crucial services uh, across our state. So um, both uh, businesses and nonprofits, in addition to participating on the forums, we've created an online directory. And so people all across Vermont come to that directory um, to uh, you know, find resources um, and, uh, you know, that, that's been an important part as well. I'll, I'll step over to uh, local democracy. Uh, again, thousands of local elected officials. In um, Vermont, uh, we have, instead of city councils, we have select boards uh, for our towns and the bigger cities have city councils. So all those select board members and city councilors, school board members, I shouldn't say all, most, a majority of them uh, actively participate on their local forums. Um, but then also other, uh, you know, uh, municipal agencies, um, things like regional planning commissions, um, superintendents of uh, school districts, et cetera, participate uh, because it's a very effective way of both reaching out with information to the community, but then also listening in and seeing what's going on. And I uh, hear all the time from leaders and, and communication folks that um, the listening in is just as important as having a, one more distribution network uh, for getting information out. So people are often curious about our business model. I'll, I'll just say that we are, as, as I said, a public benefit corporation uh, like a B Corp. And um, our social mission is front and center. But that does mean we're a non, we are a for-profit. Um, and uh, although people often mistake us uh, thinking we're a, a nonprofit. So our um, business model is primarily uh, centered around advertising sales to those local businesses and nonprofits, uh, political campaigns, et cetera. But this is not surveillance-based capitalism. We have a very simple, text only advertising product that um, is distributed by geography and date. So, so that's it. Uh, we don't surveil our members and, and then use that information to, um, to try to hyper target ads to, you know, left-handed canoeists, uh, you know, who like to click on a certain kind of website. You know, we don't do that. We, we just sell ads based on geography and, and, and the calendar. Um, our ads, I will say, have become super effective um, because of how they're really part of the whole package. So you're reading, you know, content from your neighbors, from your school board member, uh, from the nonprofit that's doing a fundraiser, et cetera, and mixed right in there are ads from your, you know, local retail businesses, um, a local manufacturer who's hiring, et cetera. It's all part of the daily flow. 
And we find people tend to talk about the postings and the ads um, in nearly equal measure. It's, it's all, you know, it's all your, what lands on that virtual front porch once a day. Um, so, you know, when we talk about reimagining the internet, um, you know, we started long enough ago that, uh, you know, we, we were imagining, we weren't reimagining, we were imagining the internet to be a, a place of, you know, a thousand different experimental projects in connecting at a local level. And there were many, but most of them have, have gone by the wayside. We've persisted for a variety of, of reasons and some, some good luck, um, and some support from critical people at critical times. But um, what's really hard to hear is when I'm approached frequently from folks who say, wow, Front Porch Forum, people who you know, live in Vermont, they'll say, it's incredible. It really works really well for me. Uh, I, just, I feel good when I use it. It meets my needs. Um, it's helping my community. You should scale it up everywhere. Um, that won't work. Um, and, and that's not because we're not smart enough or we, it's broken or something. And I, I'm sure I'm not smart enough, I'll say that, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is because it's not designed to be scalable. It's designed to serve the place where we live. And uh, the very nature of trying to design something that will scale up to national or global size uh, is at the root of so much that's wrong with big tech. Um, you know, I, I early on we we had, you know, front porch form in a lot of ways is a, a tiny, tiny microcosm of much of the rest of what goes on in the internet. Um, you know, we, we were helping people uh, connect for rides to the airport way before uh, Uber came along. And we were having neighbors uh, let out their houses while they were away on vacation so someone could stay there, you know, a neighbor's in-laws visiting could stay there long before Airbnb uh, came on the scene. Um, all that stuff continues to happen. And, and, and we were, you know, having people buying and selling and giving away things. Well, Craigslist does predate us, but, you know, uh, in, in the way that Craigslist does. So, so and people are doing social networking type things a la Facebook and, and Twitter and whatnot, um, you know, on Front Porch Forum for, for a long time before those things uh, showed up. So we've seen a tiny microcosm of, of so much of what goes on on the internet. And most of what we've seen has been really good and positive in the place where we live. I mean, my wife and I were raising our families here, all my employees, colleagues, are, you know, live here, it's our home. Um, but we've also seen Front Porch Forum do damage. Um, and we take that very seriously. I mean, th these, again, these are, it's real. And so um, when someone reports that they feel humiliated, when they feel like they can't show up to a school board meeting because of what happened on Front Porch Forum or whatever, or they feel like maybe they need to move out of their community now because of something that was said, these kind of things happened on our platform in our early years. And we learned hard lessons and we upped our moderation. We, we evolved our policies and we continue to, to this day to do that. It, it's, um, it's not easy. And, and, and uh, we don't have a perfect record, but we are, we are absolutely engaged and, and working hard to make it right um, every step of the way. Which brings me to 2020. Um, 2020, of course, uh, will go down in history as a, you know, an incredibly difficult year on many fronts. And uh, I mentioned, you know, Front Porch Forum's a microcosm of the whole internet. Vermont, Vermont's a microcosm of our whole country in a way. Um, what the rest of the, what was happening elsewhere was definitely happening in Vermont, be it the pandemic, uh, be it economic struggles, be it racial justice struggles, um, 
uh, uh, all the things around the election and conspiracy theories and um, yeah, uh, you know, on and on, uh, divis uh, divisiveness uh, among neighbors. And our moderation policies, our feature set, uh, it was all put to the test and challenged. And we did our best to stick to, you know, you know what had worked previously. And then we realized areas that we needed to change and, and improve on. Our whole staff went through um, racial justice training. We evolved our policies along those lines. Um, uh, same with the pandemic, uh, same with the election. And what we, what we came away with one, this is an oversimplification, but we, we uh, realized that we couldn't allow content that, um, that uh, was to the detriment of public health or that was racist in any, any way or that um, uh, was detrimental to democracy. So I'll leave it more for the Q&A, but uh, yeah, Ethan, give me a long tether and I'll take all of it. So thank you for the opportunity to share. Michael, thank you for that. I, um, Michael and I have been getting to, to know each other um, over, over this last year. And uh, so I, I'm a Front Porch Forum subscriber. I'm not actually uh, in Vermont, but I'm adjacent. And uh, Williamstown, Mass is the only Massachusetts town that's in uh, Front Porch Forum. But um, I, I will tell you that um, getting Vermonters um, to speak publicly uh, can be a very challenging thing to do. There's a running joke that you can tell um, the extroverted Vermonter because he's the one who will look at your shoes while you're speaking uh, as opposed to his own shoes. So um, uh, I, I had to talk Michael up from five minutes to 10 minutes to 15 minutes in giving the talk. And I'm, I'm really grateful, Michael, to hear some of those reflections in particular um, those reflections about how issues like racial justice have, have come into play uh, even on Front Porch Forum. Can I get you to stop sharing your screen so that uh, I, I can hand over uh, the mic over to, to Sarah Lomax-Reese? Um, I just wanted to remind you that, that uh, Sarah is coming from uh, a, a different perspective on this. Her work is rooted in WURD, which is a radio station with extremely deep roots in Philadelphia, under her leadership, it's a radio station that is now really turned into a multimedia property and one that is connecting the community in Philadelphia and particularly providing a voice for African Americans in Philadelphia as the only black owned radio station in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, Sarah, I learn from you every time you talk. Uh, I am so thrilled that you could join us. Let me hand the mic over to you, please. Well, you've got to unmute. Yes, I, mean, do I, it. I do that all the time. No, um, it, it's not a Zoom conference until someone does it. So I know, right? The ice. I know. So um, thank you very much, Ethan, for the invitation. Michael, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. And um, I'm going to start sharing and just jump right in to, um, to my uh, presentation. Wait a second. Give me a second here. Uh, Take your time, life is good. Yeah, give me a second, give me a second, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, wait a second, wait a second. That's okay. There is not a single person on this call who has not struggled with slides on a Zoom call, <laughs> I promise you. Every one of us has been through some version of this and- uh, Here we go, here we go. Here we, we all get it. All right. All right. Take it away, my friend. Woo. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everyone. I am Sarah Lomax Reese. I'm the president and CEO of WURD Radio, as um, Ethan introduced me. Um, and I'm just going to go through this, um, this, this presentation deck. Um, this is my father, Walter P. Lomax Jr., MD, and uh, that's Martin Luther King. <laughs> if you didn't recognize him. Um, my father is the founder of WURD. He was uh, an amazing physician. He was a philanthropist and he was um, a very successful businessman. 
Um, he became so successful that he had the financial wherewithal to purchase WURD in 2002. And he did that for the sole reason he was not a media person. He consumed media. He read everything. He listened to, to Black Talk Radio. Um, he was a very learned person, but he was not in the business of media at all. But he bought WURD because someone came to him, a, um, a radio icon from Philadelphia, who came to my father and said, um, Doc, you know, a lot of people know that you have resources. A lot of people are going to come to you for, um, for money and, and to support their various uh, issues and causes. But you're not going to be able to support everyone. But through, if you acquire this radio station, WURD, you'll be able to give everyone a voice. And that is as powerful, if not more powerful, than, um, than, than just dollars. And so, you know, uh, Philadelphia has this incredible history of Black Talk Radio. And in 2002, it was about to basically go dark because, um, you know, the, the, the legacy station was going out of business. And again, um, someone came to my father and asked him if he would purchase WURD, which was on the market at the time. And he was persuaded by that argument about giving people a voice and particularly Black people a voice. And so um, we are locally owned, family owned. I run it. Uh, my family owns it. Um, we're incredibly focused on our audience and are all about trying to solve uh, the challenges and problems that emerge um, through our two-way talk format. Um, we are mission driven. Um, even though we are for profit, we are a commercial station, but we are very much about um, serving the community. And we see ourselves as the, the voice of uh, Philadelphia's Black community. And um, let me see if I can move this out of the way. I don't know if that's showing up for you guys. Um, so, you know, just in, in terms of our, um, our uh, range of, of what we do, we, are, we broadcast both on AM and FM. Um, we started as an AM and uh, in 2017, they did this thing in the radio world where you could uh, purchase an FM translator. And so that was like a huge, huge process um, to, to go through, but we were successful. I mean, it was like many, many moving parts um, to satisfy the FCC's requirements. But in 2017, we, we simulcast on AM and FM. Uh, we have a membership program called the Forward Movement. Um, where people who can basically get whatever we do for free um, believe so deeply in what we do, they pay $90 a year to uh, be a member. And we, we have all kinds of perks and, and benefits associated with it. Um, and then we, we also it, have expanded into um, video and definitely a lot in terms of social and uh, just expanded our digital offerings, which I'll get into a little bit more. And so we've developed to be this very multimedia, multi-platform um, organization that's both audio and digital events, a lot of community events, pre-COVID, social, and our member, um, our membership uh, program. And then, you know, like again, pre-COVID, we were out in the street all the time. We curate over a hundred community engagement events per year that could range anything from like a, a major event that, um, that we produce um, with, with uh, you know, keynote speakers and stuff like that to just going to an event where we're broadcasting live, you know, so we're like, have Mike, we'll travel. And so we became very well known for being embedded in the community and being on site at various uh, events. And another key part of our growth and evolution um, has been around partnerships. We've developed partnerships with uh, other media organizations, with business organizations, um, with, um, you know, cultural organizations, the free library, just everyone, because we really are one of the few uh, media organizations that really have instantaneous access and, and uh, engagement with the Black community all the time. And um, mm -hmm. I'll get into this in just a second. Um, Philadelphia is a very Black town. Uh, so this is just a, a, a visual of some of the events that, that we um, do, both from like, you know, marches and rallies, not that we do them, but we cover them, 
to curated events and and things like that. And so we're we're very much um, in in the community. Um, and this is just uh, we did a, a a marketing campaign on the buses in Philly. So we were literally on the road. Um, just a little bit of of background on Philadelphia's um, demographics. You know, we're the fifth largest market in the United States. Um, it is a very black town. It's about 45, 44% um, black slash African-American. Um, and really, you know, it's about, I think 15% Latino and 8% uh, Asian. So it is one of those very majority minority cities, you know, Philadelphia is. Um, and one of the, the, the other things that, that we have, we contend with is it's the poorest big city in the nation. And there's and, and with that comes a lot of different um, societal challenges in terms of high unemployment, in terms of um, you know like low literacy and, and a lot of things. And so we we at WURD really try and wade into all of those things, um, just from you know a, a programming standpoint in terms of our core product, which is the the um, the the radio uh, content. We are a, a talk. Uh, a talk station. So it's a two way format people and we we are not big on screening calls. So, you know, you can kind of get you get what you get. And so whoever's a guest or whoever is uh, moderating the conversations have to be very nimble and, and, and able to one, um, you know, make sure the information is correct that's being shared, but also um, to to just be able to react in a in a constructive way. But it's a very powerful opportunity for the Black community, which is, you know, does not have very many vehicles to speak and be heard, to really engage and to allow uh, a forum for the diversity of the Black community. So, you know, we have everything from, you know, religious diversity to geographic diversity in terms, we have people who listen from, you know, Germany and Australia and other places. And then we, we also have, um, you know, the diaspora, the black diaspora, Jamaican, Haitian and African who are a part of the Philadelphia community and all of we try and create spaces for the, the, the broadest range of voices to be heard. Um, so we can we can really show that the black community is not monolithic in, in any way, shape or form. Um, we also broadcast city council live. Um, we're the only radio station in the city that broadcasts a, a weekly um, and it's basically like a C-SPAN like thing, thing where, um, you know, we're, we're just airing it. And so the community can hear what are their city council members voting on? What are the debates? Who are the, what are the big issues that the, their, their local elected governmental officials are, um, are discussing and navigating? And so that's, that's a very powerful community service that I think that, that we provide. We also have um, live and local programming from 6 a.m. to uh, 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. And that's unique too, because um, a lot of black radio stations might have a talk show or uh, you know, a, a, a block of talk shows, but we are like, you know, sun up to sundown talk. And that's that's very, very unique. Um, just like some statistics about black radio. A lot of people say radio's dead, radio's dying. Well, I'm here to say that we're alive and kicking and in the black community, it is still a very powerful medium. And um, although, you know, our format, the black talk format, it is absolutely dwindling. We are one of only three remaining black talk stations in the country. And, um, you know, it's a very hard business model to make work. And so, you know, and, and we see the, the, the number of black owned radio stations and, and television stations in general dwindling, whether it's music or, or a talk format, but the talk format is particularly, um, is, is particularly uh, small. And so um, just a, a little bit about our, our demographics, as you can imagine, you know, we're AM and FM terrestrial radio. Uh, so our audience skews older. Um, it's prim primarily in that kind of 45 to, to 65 plus, um, I, I'll say 45 and up range. Um, we have the most loyal, committed, um, invested readers, I mean, not readers, listeners uh, anywhere. And so um, it skews a little bit more female to male, 
but um, we do have a growing kind of um, digital uh, audience that, that especially with COVID, we really were able to, to grow our, our digital listens as well as our video streams, which I'll get into in, in a minute. Um, yeah, so like with everyone, you know, COVID kind of created uh, an, an urgency around uh, digital expansion. And so, you know, reimagining the, the internet, um, I don't know if we are reimagining the internet, but we certainly um, leaned in um, both into kind of our digital capacity and, and had to up our digital game tremendously, but we also leaned more deeply into our audio, our radio platform, because what we found with COVID was that everybody was doing Zoom. Everybody was, was, was really trying to figure out how to stay relevant in, um, in this, this COVID moment. And we were like, wow, we have this, this, um, this unique element that is radio. And so we made sure that we didn't just pivot to try and do everything um, video, but we, we simulcasted everything we did on video, we did on, on audio. And so we had to make sure that our content was relevant, both in the audio and video platforms. And we, we it had, had installed cameras in our studios prior to COVID, but we were kind of like dabbling around with it. But with COVID, we doubled down and we created what we call Word TV. And what that is, is basically what's broadcasting in our studios. It's, uh, it's, it's simulcast onto Facebook Live, YouTube, and um, through our wordradio.com um, website. And so, you know, it, the video capacity has, has just taken off. And we're now in a position where we're, we're starting to really curate um, our, our video content the same way that we're trying to curate our audio content. And this is just an example of some of our most recent special broadcasts that were both um, video and audio. And um, like just yesterday, we have a, a very contentious DA de, um, uh, election that's coming up next Tuesday, uh, May 18th. And yesterday we had the two candidates squaring off. One is very progressive um, and one is, is, well, so I'll put it this way, one is, is endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police and one is endorsed by, you know, the black churches, the black, you know, progressives, the black everything else. And so, um, you know, it was a very fascinating um, debate and one that, that really centered the concerns and issues of the black community, which you did not get in the, the, the two other debates that, um, that happened pre previously. And so, you know, we are able to kind of show our differentiator. Um, also today, if you look um, on the end, it says, remember, um, remember move. And so, you know, today, uh, May 13th is the 36th anniversary of the move bombing. So many people know nothing about this incredibly tragic, horrific moment in Philadelphia history when a bomb a government sanctioned bomb was dropped on this house that had 13 um, people in it and 11 of them died. Um, I think five or six of them were children. And so every year, word does a major spotlight on because I would, you know, so many people and it decimated an entire city block. So, so many people are still alive from that, from that horrific moment, but a lot of people don't know about it. So we dedicated today to doing um, a day long kind of remembrance of, of MOVE. And that's kind of just an example of the kind of work that we're uniquely positioned to do that, um, you know, is, is, is centering our audience. And that is um, a multimedia expl um, uh, uh, pub promotion and, and um, uh, uh, execution. Um, we also have dabbled with podcasts. This was a podcast that, that I uh, moderated um, that really was a retrospective of how WURD covered the big issues in 2020. So, you know, the, um, the COVID crisis, the racial justice uprisings, the um, 2020 election, and then one just really, one episode, it was four episodes, one episode just really looking at how black radio is uniquely positioned 
to explore these different issues. And so, you know, word was, um, was, was we were able to, and I look at it really as almost like an archive now because it really captures what we as a team, as an organization went through in this amazingly challenging um, and consequential year in 2020. So we're considering doing more podcasts as we go, go along. We also have um, two verticals. One is called EcoWord. It's an environmental justice initiative, um, which we started in 2018. And it's very much looking at the intersection of um, health, economics, uh, the environment, and the Black community, and social justice. And so we're, 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 we do regular weekly segments. We are one of the few Black uh, media outlets that are covering environmental justice from a Black perspective um, all the time. We have a partnership with Covering Climate Now, which is um, you know out of the Columbia Journalism Review organization. And we just, um, again, really trying to look at what are the issues that disproportionately affect the Black community and how can we um, you know, communicate and, and, and create conversations and content around these issues that educate, inform, and inspire. And what a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people in, think of environmental justice or environmental issues, and they think of like, you know, white Birkenstock wearing people in Vermont, <laughs> sorry, Michael, um, and, and, you know, like tree huggers and stuff like that. But when you, when you really look at the, the realities, black communities are the communities that are on the front lines of, you know, most of the pollution, most of the, the, these refineries and these things that, that are put smack dab in the middle of black communities, which creates, you know, disproportionate rates of, of asthma and breast cancer and, you know, learning difficulties and all of these things because of our environment. So we're we're really looking at um, how we can make these issues um, relevant and and connect with our community. We we do what I call service journalism. Um, some people wouldn't wouldn't necessarily call it that, but we we do um, we have a, a a health campaign going on right now called Go to Know which is all about trying to educate our listeners about colorectal cancer and how they can take a kind of a non-invasive test to, um, to, to find out if they are um, predisposed or, or are, are at risk for colorectal cancer. And so that's in partnership with a, a few, um, with a few health systems and things like that, but it's all about education and awareness. We also have uh, an initiative called Livelihood, which, um, was launched in, in 2019. And um, it was really about connecting, looking at the poverty rate and the high unemployment rates in the black community. And it's um, really about using all of our platforms to connect black Philadelphians to jobs, um, small business resources, um, you know, financial literacy, entrepreneurship opportunities, and to also help corporations in Philadelphia connect with diverse talent. And so, you know, we we really take our job seriously about um, how we can use our platforms to wade into and to to try and resolve and solve some of the, the intractable problems in Philadelphia. Just about our our revenue mix, our business model. Like I said, we are for profit. Right now, we our membership is about ten percent of our of our revenues. About 15% we get from grants and about 75% from advertising and sponsorships. We're hoping to, to shift that in the future to be more membership heavy, um, a little bit more grant heavy and a little less reliant on advertising and sponsorships. And then the other is, you know, is like merch and, and other kinds of things. And then, you know, this is just kind of a sample of how we kind of position WURD for um, you know, in terms of the different, um, the different assets that we have that we, we can, um, you know, leverage or sell like on air, digital, annual events, vignettes, um, and, and all kinds of live and virtual events, um, newsletters and things like that. I wanted to just take a second and I'm about to wrap up um, just to, to let folks know that um, in addition to WURD, I also co-founded a new company called URL Media, which is all about creating um, 
a network of high performing black and brown owned local media organizations. And so we, we, we started, we've started with eight, Word is one of them. And um, we have Palabra, Haitian Times, Epicenter, Scroll, Stack, um, TBN24, Documented, and Scalawag. And each of these organizations are um, serving their local communities really uh, effectively and, and, and authentically. And what we wanted to do with URL was kind of create an, an, uh, an opportunity to aggregate our, uh, our reach, our content, and um, potentially develop um, greater uh, visibility and, and reach for our content. And, and then as well, create additional ways to generate revenues for black and brown owned um, media organizations. So I think, and, and it, this, this uh, it, it, it hinges very much on uh, technology and, um, and local. So we're trying to get the, the reach of national and, and um, the, by, by creating this network, but also be very intentional about serving individual um, specific communities. And I think that's it. It's such an amazing overview. Um, let me just sort of mention to people while you shut down your slides that um, if you're not following already, you should be following on Word, O-N-W-U-R-D on Twitter. Uh, from following, I just found out that your um, two hour uh, piece on Move is actually going to be airing at 5 p.m. tonight. Yes, yes. Um, just for people who don't have evening plans, uh, mm -hmm. let me just say that the perfect evening would be learning about the history of uh, Move through Word and then uh, joining us at 7 p.m. Uh, for our closing session tonight, which is going to, not closing session, our, our late night session, uh, which is going to be an amazing conversation about alternative spaces online uh, with some leaders of uh, the LGBTQ community in the Middle East and uh, a group that works with sex workers online out of Australia. So if you want a, a truly uh, media diverse evening, uh, use us, start with Word, go from there. Um, I'm hoping it's making sense to people why I wanted to bring the two of you together with such different communities, but you know, at the heart, you know, more or less the same business model and the same values. And I, I, I just, it really struck me uh, the ways in which the two of you are, are dealing with um, some very similar and some very different questions. We have a ton uh, of questions coming up for you and uh, people, please keep them coming. Uh, I'm gonna start with a question from John Davidow. Could both of your guests talk about collaboration with the public radio stations in their respective communities? Is there a more expansive opportunity to serve your audiences with Vermont Public Radio and WHYY, two leading stations in the public radio ecosystem? Do you want to start on that, Sarah, and then we'll, we'll hand that over to Michael? Yeah, no, um, we do a lot with WHYY. We have content sharing. Um, so so there's a couple of things that, that I've experienced. Um, as an independent black owned uh, media organization that's smaller, like partnerships oftentimes with bigger organizations can be very lopsided. And so, you know, trying to, to, to advocate and, and make sure that it's, it's equal and it's, you know, you're equally yoked and it's not just, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have the WHYY people on, we're gonna have the WHYY content on our platforms but they're not reciprocating and, and including ours. And so that's something that, that, that I'm always conscious of is making sure that it's equitable. But um, we have a great relationship with WHYY. Um, Sandra Clark, who's a good friend of mine and she's done amazing work there, um, diversifying their newsroom, diversifying their content and really leaning on us to, to help them with, um, with additional coverage. They, you know, so it's, um, we already we've done collaborative events. We've we you know we we are we we definitely um, work very closely, and it's a I think it's a very productive relationship right now. Michael, how about you with uh, with VPR? Is is VPR part of the sort of uh, media equation uh, around Front Porch Forum? 
Yeah, so um, first of all, I need to say th thank you, Sarah, for sharing everything about uh, Word. What an amazing story. I, I've, I, I've, it's a real inspiration. Um, yeah, so uh, Front Porch Forum has a, a long and, and productive relationship with uh, VPR in Vermont, uh, as well as with other uh, media in the state, uh, vtdigger.org, a, a nonprofit news uh, digital uh, organization, um, Seven Days, the Alt Weekly, are all very successful um, news enterprises in Vermont that we're, we're blessed to still have. Um, and uh, Front Porch Forum has been, we've been really grateful to have working relationships with each one, mostly in the form of um, cross promotion, um, but always exploring other opportunities. Um, the larger, in Vermont's case, statewide news organizations um, are really good at covering statewide stories, but have trouble drilling down at the really local level. And that's what happens on Front Porch Forum every day. So these small local conversations and stories. And so we've been exploring some different ideas um, of some future partnerships um, and look forward to having more to talk about down the road. So we've got a couple of questions that are specific to one or the other of you. And I, I'm gonna get to a couple of those, but there's a few that actually cut across really nicely. And, and so I'm gonna sort of prioritize those first. Um, here's one that just came up from Scott Moore. I am curious to hear how much community participation is a part of decision making. Mm -hmm. For example, the process for deciding the new 2020 moderation rules on Front Porch Forum. So Michael, you, you talked about this. You talked about how the sort of incredible divisiveness of um, 2020 had some impact. And I'll just say as someone who spends a decent amount of my time in Vermont, um, you know, everybody sort of assumes that it's Ben and Jerry's and, and Birkenstock's liberals. Um, I was driving through the town of Bennington not very long ago and I saw an equal number of Black Lives Matter and Black Guns Matter signs, mm -hmm. uh, which was not a sign that I had seen uh, previously. Um, I, how, how is FPF sort of dealing with community input on this? And then Sarah, I'm gonna put the same question to you. Well, um, every um, feature, every moderation policy, uh, really every significant decision we've ever made with Front Porch Forum has been heavily influenced by user input. Um, that said, you know, we are a small family owned business and ultimately hold the responsibility and therefore the decision-making uh, role. And so we also get a, a lot of unsolicited advice that, uh, you know, we say thank you and we put it on our list and we set it aside and we don't take. Um, I can be hard on um, male engineer types because because that's my tribe. Um, but, you know, I get lots of guys who say, well, you're doing this totally wrong. If, if you're trying to build a lost dog app, uh, you know, you, you really haven't optimized this for finding lost dogs. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And the next one will say, hey, if you're trying to build a car selling app, you really haven't optimized this for car selling. I say, yeah, you're right. We're trying to optimize from Porch Forum for stimulating connections among neighbors. And so we purposefully have friction in the system where it's not super easy and painless. You actually have to maybe go next door and talk to somebody. Um, and that's what we're trying to stimulate. So anyways, yeah, we, we definitely uh, value input from folks um, anecdotally as well as, you know, measuring things. So. Sarah, how is, how is this change for you? I, I mean, I, obviously um, you're comfortable with really lively conversation. You mentioned with no small amount of pride that there's not a lot of call screening that's going on. That's not, that wasn't pride that you detected. <laughs> okay, just, all right. <laughs> it is. <laughs> how, how has this changed? How has this changed with, um, you know, the, the visibility of racial justice movements, the uh, adoption of a false narrative by uh, the Republican Party and by the, the strains that have come from COVID? 
I mean, we've been we've been doing this work before, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, before the racial justice protests. So, you know, like like police brutality, all the things that that became really like health disparities, all of the things that became really, you know, visible and, and a, a, a top priority in, in terms of news coverage had been things we had been talking about forever. Um, you know, the black mass incarceration, you know, the, all of all of those things have been happening to the black community in Philadelphia and every and, and elsewhere for 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 decades for centuries so um, I would say that that the way that we cover it has not really changed that much what has changed is the um, the appetite for um, supporting us basically because you know like like um, when you've been when you have have a real, relationship with your audience they they trust you they believe in you they that you you know you have the ability to 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 move um uh the needle in terms of an election or in terms of of other things you have the, the ability to influence things then you know when when the 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 focus starts to shift on the actual community and the it and the the issues that those communities are concerned about then that also gives you a little bit more um, visibility and credibility. And so I feel like this is the first time I've been doing this work. I've been a black media entrepreneur since the nineties. This is the first and every single day was a struggle. Let me tell you, every single solitary day was a struggle until 2020. And that's the, that's the, the schizophrenia of it because we go through this horrific moment but it broke open something that finally the work that that I've been doing that so many people have been doing in this space is finally seen as valid. And and so, you know, I'm trying to ride the wave for as long it, as it, it it's incredible. That that was not the response that I was expecting, but now that you say it it makes perfect sense, right? I I think people have been trying to figure out um how to support a larger movement of racial justice with their capital with supportive businesses and so on and so forth. I'm thrilled that it's coming to WURD's front door. I wanna talk about the expansion. So first of all, I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear about URL. I think that's wonderful. And I love this idea that um, there could be a network of high quality black media. We have this common thread filled right now with people essentially saying, Michael, why don't you syndicate this? Why isn't this a franchise model? Why can't we open this all over um, the country? I, I would love for you sort of both to talk about what is that challenge of taking something that works in a community or a set of communities and then thinking about how it works more broadly? Michael, I know that, that you get this question a lot. Um, and I'm guessing that um, the, the fact that Vermont now includes a little bit of Far Eastern New York and one town in Massachusetts may not fully satisfy the people answering these questions. Yeah, thanks, Ethan. Um, you know, building Front Porch Forum over 20 plus years has been slow and arduous and every step of the way it's um and we've we've bootstrapped it you know we've undercapitalized no capital no capital um and you know a lot of you know 80 hour work week you know kind of situation for years um i don't know what got into me but the year we started it was the year we had four kids in diapers i, I just you know i can't quite remember what i was thinking that's probably why i it's, you know i wasn't thinking clearly my point in saying all that is it is uh, a creation of Vermonters for Vermont. And I don't know how well it would succeed elsewhere or if it even would. Um, I would much rather inspire somebody in Phoenix or LA or wherever, um, um, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to create 
their own version to put pour their blood, sweat, and tears into something that would have real roots. I mean, Front Porch Forum is firmly rooted. People say, aren't you worried about uh, next door? Which basically is, you know, they were inspired by our model and marry it to big tech uh, and venture capital. Uh, aren't you worried about them coming into Vermont? And, you know, I'm really not. We, we, we're very deeply rooted here. And of course, I'm humble and, 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 and trying to be vigilant of any kind of serious competition. But, um, but if Front Porch Forum was lightly planted in lots of other places, uh, in, in places it wasn't designed for, I have, you know, this is hard work. It's, it's not, uh, uh, you know, oh yeah, toss, you know, make another instance on the server and we'll be up and running and we should be at peak performance in six months. Um, you know, and that's kind of what folks are seem to be wanting. And uh, I, I don't think we can provide that. Yeah. Sarah, when, when, when you think about this, when you think about what's so special about WURD, when you think about your father's legacy as this sort of critical and beloved figure in the community and how that's, you know, sort of, it's a really deep set of roots. Um, could people do WURD in other black cities? Are these other partners that you're reaching out to with URL, do you see them as having a similar model, a similar values? How do, how do we get there to be more than only three black talk radio stations in the United States? Well, I think that you have to make um, access to capital more, more, uh, yeah. more available that's like the bottom line because it's it's expensive like, like you know we were undercapitalized even though you know like like i will say that that you know the fact that we did not have any debt that the station was purchased like as a cash deal and it wasn't i mean we would totally be out of business right now if we were servicing debt we'd be so out of business but the fact that we were able to kind of like figure stuff out. We had a pretty long runway to like figure out the business model. And I think a big part of that, well, I know the big, a big part of it was my father's like, you know, commitment, financial commitment to it because it was bleeding money for 10 years. I, I, I um, came on as the, the general manager and president in 2010. I was like, I don't want any part of this from 2002 to 2010. I was like, no thanks. This is like not for me. Um, but in and and so in 2010, I was able to come in and but it took it's it's taken this long to try and figure it out. Um, so I think that that people ask me all the time, oh, can you come into New York or could you come into this and and replicate the the word model? And I do. I I think like Michael, I feel like we have such a unique blend of things in Philadelphia, my father's legacy. I'm one of six kids. All of my siblings are like doing stuff, like making moves in Philadelphia. So we have like, it's me times six times the legacy of my father times, you know, all of these relationships that we've had because we're from Philly. So we've got like generations like, oh, you know, that's my play cousin or whatever, you know, like, so the roots are so deep that I don't know if what we're doing, what, what I've been able to do with the word community in Philly, if it's, it's not like add water and mix, like Michael said, in, a, in another community, because so much of this stuff has been built on relationships that are deep and wide. And, you know, that's not the kind of stuff you can, you can replicate easily. It's really interesting. Like I, I understand that people are asking in part because they want this, right? They want to be part of communities like this. I think the desire to have really functional local communities is a really deep desire. I, I also have to think that it's it's an illness, right? Like we've all been told that if you get something to run in one place, then now what you have to do is get it run nationally and then sort of internationally. You know, uh, you know, why can't we syndicate front porch to uh, uh, places that don't have front porches? Um, but I, I think it's so fascinating that you know both of you have have chosen to really stay closely rooted, to really stay primarily local, 
Uh, but to let the the sort of uh, the the borders bleed a little bit around that, Sarah, I love that there's people who are calling in from Germany or Jamaica, but they think of themselves as the greater Philly community. One of the first questions we got here it was it was from Michael, but I, I think it applies to both. It's from our friend Baba Fakamzada. Is what are the metrics? How do you know when this is working? What is it that you track to know what's going well? How do you sort of keep score internally? Um, yeah, I can respond to that. Uh, I mentioned, you know, my background's an engineer. I, I, I love spreadsheets and data. And, and so I studied what, you know, big tech was doing and first started out thinking, oh, we have to measure what they're measuring. And that'll tell us whether we're being successful. And that was not the right idea. Um, ultimately, uh, we're trying to stimulate something that's very hard to measure, which is social capital in a community. Are people more connected? Are they more invested? Do they feel a sense of ownership? Are they getting involved? Are they well-informed? That's hard to put a yardstick to those things. Um, so we have proxies, um, but they're pretty crude. Uh, uh, and so we measure, um, you know, num number of active members and number of postings and um, clicks on different things. And, you know, we measure what we can measure. Um, but we also pay careful attention to uh, what, you know, the data scientists might dismiss uh, as anecdotal, but, but, you know, user comments. And uh, we had a lot of calls every day, dozens and dozens of calls uh, f f to our member support area, uh, emails or phone calls with you know, technical issues, but oftentimes uh, other socio-political issues. And we listen to those and, and try to you know, address the question concern, but also try to listen and see is there, are there trends there uh, that we need to be addressing? Um, and, there always are. Same, same with the content in our postings, the fact that we review each posting. We have an internal system for flagging content that we should be paying attention to from a, a, a trend basis, like the things that came up in 2020. Um, so, and, and just to answer another question live, I think Saul Tenenbaum asked this one. Uh, every post really is seen by a human moderator and approved by a human moderator before it hits the feed. Yeah, I think that's that's just a, a hard thing for people to, to sort of get their heads around. Sarah, how, how do you keep score? I mean, obviously, like, you know, keeping the doors open is part of it. But what are the <laughs> metrics that you're looking at to sort of make sure that this is going in the direction you want it to go? Sure. So, so I'm not an engineer type. I, I think I'm more on the artist spectrum than the, the engineer um, uh, side. So, you know, we obviously we have like, like analytics that we're that we're tracking, you know, like, you know, social media, um, data analytics, Google, um, you know, Google analytics, and, and all of the things that you can measure very specifically through um, social media and the, the digital, you know, views, page views and all of that stuff. But, but to me, the real metric is, um, you know, how it, it's really word of mouth. Like art, when you go out into the community, like I had somebody following me around in Costco because I had a word sweatshirt on and a word mask on. And they're like, are you, do you work for word? You look like someone. And so, you know, it's really the, the, whether or not you influence, are you influencing policy? You know, like, like we did a thing where, you know, one of our hosts was like, we, we, the, the police commissioner um, had to step down for, for some, some reason, some, you know, uh, misconduct issue. And so our host said, you know, we need to have, we need to have an African-American woman police commissioner. And he got on like this tear and don't you know, the mayor, like, found an African-American woman police commissioner. Now she's in all kinds of hot water now, but um, there, to, so, so to see the things that we talk about, about translated into policy or appointments or action, to me, that's the most, and, and to hear, you know, that the phone lines of a elected official were flooded because we were like, look, you need to call your elected official 
to me, that's that's measuring um, impact, and that's the impact that that I'm most uh, interested in. I mean, but we're we're measuring caller volume, event attendance, membership numbers. You know, we're measuring everything that we can measure. But you know, to me, it's it's really like, are are you moving the needle? Are you I, making? I, are you changing people's lives? I I love it. I I love the the notion that real sort of. <clears throat> community power and and that ability to make those voices heard. I mean, much as your father was saying, trying to give a voice to Black Philadelphia and actually having the impact from it. I'm I'm going to ask one last question. It's it's a good one, I think, for both of you, uh, and it comes from Christine Turner, um, Sarah, and Michael. How would you speak to your organization's governance? How will the values and practices of your organizations? be sustained beyond your individual involvements. And I would just add to this, you, you are both so clearly visionary founders, right? You are people who took a path that's quite different from what other people did. It's clearly rooted in your values and in who you are. Those sorts of organizations often have a really tough time when the founder needs to move on to something else because that person's vision and sort of personal leadership is so powerful. Um, how, are you, how are you thinking through those things? Michael, I'd, I'd love to throw that at you first. How are you thinking about governance of, of the organization? Sure, thanks. So we started um, FPF and a lot of people ask us, why aren't you a nonprofit? Why isn't FPF a nonprofit? And uh, because we are so, mission centric, but um, I didn't want to be stuck in a grant chasing mode all the time. I had been in those roles before. I didn't want to contort our mission to fit some philanthropies, you know, funding cycle. Um, it, and so I didn't want to do that. All, then other people say, well, why don't you take outside investment? Well, the same thing. I didn't want to, I had a very particular approach in mind. I didn't want some investors sitting on a board saying you have to do, you know, you have to cut to the, the shortest path to the money. Um, and so control has been really important um, in this project. And for whatever success we've had, I, I've been very grateful to be able to, you know, have my hands on the steering wheel. Um, that said, yeah, it's a question. What, what happens next down the road? And so, um, Front Porch Formas organizes a, a public benefit corporation. So that gives some measure of protection to our social mission. But, um, you know, we have been exploring other ideas, but, but basically we're in exploration mode right now. Um, Co-op, employee ownership, um, you know, different models we're looking at. Um, but the first step for all of those, as my understanding is, is like when you want to sell your house, like, you know, first thing you do is you clean the house up and you put a fresh coat of paint on it. And, you know, so we've been working real hard to get all our internal systems working really well um, and really efficient and, um, uh, and real clarity on things like mission, vision, values, having sessions, writing those things down, uh, refining them over time. So when the time comes, I feel like we'll be in a really good position to figure out that next step. But we're not quite there. Sarah, how are you thinking about this? What 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 happens when you don't want to be working eighty hour weeks uh, on work? I'm already there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I I do I do actually think about um, succession. I saw that in the chat. Um, succession um, a lot, not because I. Um, I don't want to, you know, like like I've I've figured it out and I don't want to do the work anymore, but because I recognize that um, you know, it it has to be it it can't be a a an individual kind of driving something um, a, a charismatic leader. It it has to be socialized and it has to be something that is um is 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 felt and is internalized um, in the whole organization. So one thing I try and be very clear about the fundamental core of, of what WURD is about. And I try and say that over and over and over again to my entire team, which is this 
radio station, this organization is not about us. It's not about me. It's not about any individual personality. It's not about my father. It's not about any individual. It's about our community. It's about the people. And, and we have to be constantly thinking about how is what we're doing in service to the people. And so, so I, I feel like that mission has been you know, socialized and has been embraced. And people come to work at Word because they believe in, in, in that sentiment. And so, you know, um, I feel like um, just being able to it very intentionally looking all the time at within the organization is like, who are the, who are the rising stars that can be, who can be groomed and, and elevated to potentially, I'm, I'm constantly looking for who can replace me who in this organization has the chops to, to do what I'm doing and, and do it in another way? And finally, you know, just bringing it back to URL Media, um, which stands for Uplift, Respect, and Love, um, it is a network of high-performing Black and Brown-owned media organizations. And what that does from a succession standpoint, in my mind, is it broadens our, our tent. So I'm actually able to attract um, a, you know, like like talent that might not necessarily look at just word because they see it as as too local, but because we're a part of this broader network that has um, reach beyond Philadelphia and reach beyond um, just a, our, our hyper local audience, I feel like I'm able to attract um, a different level of talent that might not come if it was just kind of a um, you know, hyper local talk radio station. And so that too is part of my succession strategy is like staying true to our mission, but broadening the, the aperture, so to speak, so that there's, um, there seems to be more opportunity for growth. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Thank you both so much. I, I think you've really um, done a great job of just obliterating a bunch of assumptions that people tend to bring to media, that the goal is to keep growing at all times, that it's to be nationwide, that it's to expand. And I think understanding um, just how important it is to be rooted within a community, that you want communities to do things their own way, that every place has its own idiosyncrasies and histories and that we are built on top of those things. Um, you know, obviously the two of you are both overnight successes, you know, uh, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to this position of visibility and leadership in a mere 20 years. Um, but I hope that, um, that it's been fun for the two of you as well. And I'm, I'm just really grateful um, for having you with us. For the folks who tuned in, first of all, thank you. I know we have asked for a ton of time from you this week. It was thrilling to see that we were up to about 150 at one point today. Um, come on back this evening, please. We've got another set of great conversations. Tonight's theme is um, people who've been innovating because they couldn't find spaces online. And so we're gonna talk to Ezra al Shafe who was concerned about the safety of online platforms for gay and lesbian youth in the Arab world and ended up building her own platform, AWA, um, to help those groups. And then we're gonna talk with Eliza Sorensen uh, from Assembly 4. This is a group based out of Australia that has been providing spaces online for sex workers after US platforms deplatformed all of them due to SESTA FOSTA. So it's gonna be fascinating. Uh, if for nothing else, come to see what jacket I wear next. Uh, it's a very exciting vest next time. I've had to have six outfits for this week. Um, thank you all so much. And uh, this will be online tomorrow on the Knight Institute site. Again, Sarah, Michael, thank you so much for being with us and uh, see folks in a few hours. Thank you.